Good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Hess, and I'm the Dean of the School of Education at the UW-Madison. I'm delighted to be here tonight as your MC. I do want to mention that in the role of MC, I am not taking a stand on the referendum, and I'm not representing a stand by the School of Education or by the UW-Madison uh, either. I'm so happy to be here, though, because I think this is going to be an exciting opportunity for us to learn more information about the referendum, which is why we've all come. Let me uh, welcome all of you in the audience and also welcome those of you who are watching over Facebook live stream. Let me give you a little sense of how the evening's going to work. We're going to begin in just a minute with a short uh, presentation by the superintendent, and that will be followed by questions and answers from a panel. Um, you will be uh, given an opportunity to write questions on the cards that are here and distributing, putting them in the box, or you can hold them up and somebody will pick them up. Uh, there's an opportunity to send in questions on Facebook as well. Most of the evening is going to be devoted to your questions answered by the panelists. So without any further ado, let me introduce to you the superintendent of the Madison Metropolitan School District, Dr. Jennifer Cheatham. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thanks for joining me and our team tonight to learn more about the school district referendum. Um, there has certainly been a lot of attention to the election in recent months. Um, in addition to the national news, you will see a question on the backside of the ballot. I um, want to remind everyone of that, that we believe is incredibly important to our community. So I thank you for coming to learn more tonight. And for those of you who are watching uh, via Facebook, thank you for tuning in. As a school district, our role is to share information about the referendum so that you can make informed decisions when you vote. Um, as Diana Hess mentioned, as a public school district, we are not permitted to use public funds to advocate for or against the referendum. Uh, that means that we're here to share information about the district's progress, our budget, and the referendum itself, um, and of course, to provide time to answer your questions. Our vision as a school district is that every school becomes a thriving school that prepares every child to graduate ready for college, career, and community. We're on a mission to raise student achievement for all and address the gaps in opportunity that we believe lead to gaps in student achievement. And we're making exciting progress. We have built momentum in our district and we're creating more. Our work is gap narrowing. In addition to seeing improvement across student groups, we're beginning to see acceleration. And I would argue that this progress is not by accident. We've made progress as a result of the intentional actions that we've been taking in crucial areas of focus. Is it enough? Never. Do we all demand more? Absolutely, yes. But I firmly believe we've built the foundation necessary to make even bolder moves in the future and stronger results. Instead of just talking about gaps in achievement, we are taking them head on because we know how much is in our power to change the trajectory for students. All of our charge is to ensure that our students' achievement matches their amazing potential. I'd like to give you a couple of examples of that gap narrowing progress. First, um, I want to highlight that early reading is on the rise. We know students who aren't reading by third grade will struggle, I believe, unnecessarily in life. In the past year, we've seen all students' groups show increases in foundational reading skills by the end of second grade. Overall, as a district, we saw a six-point increase to 78% meeting benchmark in just one year. But we saw a 12-point increase for African-American students, a 10-point increase for Latino students, 10 points for students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, 9 points for students with disabilities, and 7 points for English language learners. We're also seeing more students reading uh, proficiently by third grade. African-American students, for example, have seen a 10-point increase in reading proficiency in just the last two years compared to a 5-point increase overall. This is gap-narrowing progress, it's not incremental, it's accelerated. So how are we doing it? I believe these results are the effect of great teaching and more coherence across schools, stronger first reading instruction in the primary years, more systematic use of early intervention, better use of our tutoring partnerships, better use of our summer and after-school after programming and a focused effort in the 12 elementary schools that received the most intensive support. Nine of those 12 schools exceeded or far exceeded the district's average gain in the past year. Schools like Fogg, like Alice, like Hawthorne and Mendota. 
On the other end of the spectrum, uh, I want to talk about high schools. Our graduation rates continue to move in the right direction. We know that today even a high school <laughs> diploma isn't enough, and yet we have far too many students graduating without one, which means they will struggle unnecessarily in life. In the past two years, we've increased two percentage points overall to 80.4% graduating, but with promising results for many student groups who need acceleration. Five points for African American students, 10 points for students with disabilities, four points for students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. It's important to know that there's a one-year lag in grad rates, um, so this measures the progress that we've made in only the first two years of implementation of our plan. But we've also seen accelerated progress um, in schools. In two of our four high schools, for example, we've made double-digit jumps um, in those two years for African-American students, the student group that historically um, has the lowest graduation rates. 74% of African-American students are now graduating in four years at Memorial and 80% here at La Follette. This is also gap-narrowing progress. So how are we doing it? These gains are the direct result, I believe, of the more disciplined way of working we're establishing in our high schools. One that supports better teaching, more coherence, alignment of our core courses to standards, more consistent grading practices, stronger teaming practices, and great attention to keeping ninth graders on track, which we know is going to pay off in the long run. We're also seeing improvement in diversity hiring. We know it's critical that our students are taught by the best and the brightest teachers, stellar teachers, who reflect the diversity of our student body. We never want a student to struggle unnecessarily because of lack of quality instruction or a lack of connection that he or she feels with a teacher. We hired nearly 60 new teachers of color just this past hiring season, which is significantly more than what we've done in the past. And that's building on successful diversity efforts at the central office, leadership team, and within the principal leadership team. So again, how are we doing it? We created a clear set of competencies aligned to our expectations for great teaching and great leadership a process to test those competencies. We moved the hiring process up significantly to increase our competitiveness. And we started recruiting for the mission, all with the goal of ensuring that every child has a great teacher and every school has a great leader. While we're getting better at making su successful offers to aspiring educators of color, we know that the real answer is in creating a pipeline of future teachers who want to enter our wonderful profession. We don't believe school districts get results, um, not like these, simply by adding initiatives or adding costly programs, by pretending that we can solve society's problems on our own, um, by bashing teachers or by outsourcing our challenges. While we're certainly making important programmatic investments and changes to eliminate barriers to, su to student success, we actually believe this is about a way of working. Our theory of action starts with the school improvement planning process, which establishes the disciplined way of work we know is necessary to raise student achievement and narrow gaps. While every one of our schools focuses on their plan, we function as one large learning community, learning together what great teaching looks like that's culturally responsive, that's linguistically responsive, which also includes the internal work of understanding racial bias. And last, we understand um, that it's critical that we organize our central office around schools, providing them with the tools and resources they need to get the job done and to remove the institu institutional barriers that stand <coughs> um, in the way of our school success. Bottom line, we believe our results improve when we fundamentally change the way we do our daily work, which means great teachers and great principals in partnership with family and community, making better decisions on behalf of children every single day. And this year, I want to point out, our major focus across the entire school district is working in partnership with families to make better decisions. Every school now has a family <coughs> community engagement action team to inform how decisions get made at the school level. Every school is strengthening its two-way communication with families. 
every school is finding ways to better link their interactions with families directly to our common goals for student learning. I know that's happening at La Follette tonight. Um, and in our two community schools, we'll be learning about what it means to truly share power with parents and community and to collaboratively address the challenges beyond our classroom walls. This is a strategy we think is essential to accelerate results for student learning system-wide. I want to shift and talk a little bit about bu budget because the disciplined way of working that we've embraced as a school district um, extends to our budget. Since my first year as superintendent, a few years ago, when we went through a zero-based budgeting process, realigning all of our funding to district's priorities, we've been guided by a set of guiding principles and goals for budget development. And each year, a critical step of the budget development process has been the identification of a set of priority actions aligned to our strategic framework to help move our district forward, building on our success and driving for more. We've insisted on this process even during challenging budget times when most districts resort to uh, just cost-cutting me measures, uh, an austerity approach. That's because we believe that you cannot let challenging state budget budgets put us into reactive mode, distract from the work that we know is good for our students. We find efficiencies, we repurpose funding, and we keep our efforts focused on improving achievement for all of our students. But I do need to emphasize that challenging state budgets make it harder. I guarantee we'd be making difficult choices to reprioritize our efforts to accelerate student performance without these budget challenges. We'd be doing it anyway. Budgets are by their very nature about the allocation of scarce resources. We always need to ch challenge ourselves to make sure we're putting every single dollar to its highest and best use. That's our job. But now, every two years, our careful planning efforts are compromised by a state budget process that consistently underfunds public education. The state budget denies local school boards the funding authority necessary to adequately support schools. MMSD has seen less than 1% revenue growth for the past two years, requiring difficult budget balancing choices that have slowed down and sometimes um, stalled our efforts, meaning we could have been doing more. Not only that, but during the current two-year state budget, MMSD had to make a 3% cut to our current staff, to our workforce. That resulted in a reduction of about 120 positions. That's in addition to changes that we've made regarding health insurance premiums. Based on our own conservative projections, budgets will continue to have less than 1% revenue growth. For the 17-19 school budgets, that means deeper and more disruptive cuts while eliminating at least another 120 positions. And putting our priority actions, those things that we believe are improving student outcomes, at risk yet again. Make no mistake, the political climate does not in any way, shape, or form weaken our resolve to make progress on behalf of children, but it does make our jobs more difficult. It creates a monumental distraction and it threatens the positive momentum that we've built. So the referendum you'll see on the back of the ballot is about asking our community for support not only to avoid deeper and deeper cuts to our classrooms, but also to keep us moving forward. Investing in actions uh, like the ones that I've described that make gap-narrowing progress for our children. Our purpose goes beyond just maintaining financial stability during another difficult budget year. We're determined to build on recent gains while accelerating the pace of improvement through our district. So what are the details of the referendum? The question on the back of the ballot, I keep repeating that, I hope it's sinking in, um, asks to permanently raise the school district revenue limit authority to $26 million. That increase would be phased in over four years. If the referendum passes, then our school board would have the authority to decide on how to use that revenue authority each year during its budget process. Unlike a capital referendum, um, where we're building facilities or upgrading facilities. This means that the referendum funds would be available to use to keep our 50 schools operating and improving. What does that mean for taxpayers? 
First, it's important to know that we developed the referendum by carefully considering the impact on taxpayers. We believe it's important to be good stewards of our taxpayer funding and present a reasonable proposal that does not overly burden our community. The proposal keeps future tax levy increases under 4% per year. In addition, because of a very strong tax base growth in our community and steady enrollment, we're able to diffuse the impact on taxpayers. That's important. The tax impact for an average value home in Madison would be $35.76 per year, which is about $3 per month for four years before leveling off in 2020. Many have asked us exactly what will the funds be spent on if the referendum passes? What is the detailed spending plan? First, we would use it um, to fend off deep disruptive cuts to our schools. In other words, if the referendum passes, it would allow us to continue the services and supports um, that we need to and prevent us from having to cut large numbers of staff, increase class sizes, and make deeper and more disruptive cuts um, to our programs and we would use it to accelerate progress. Um, and that's the progress that I've described earlier in my presentation. The funds would be built into our budget each year and used to fund things like continuing and expanding strategies that have begun to narrow achievement gaps, like our successful targeted early literacy strategy. It would help us keep class sizes small. It would help us hire and retain the very best teachers and continue to diversify our workforce. It would be used to integrate technology into the classroom to enhance student learning. It would be used to support our students as they transition into that critical ninth grade year to keep them on track. And it would be used to implement personalized pathways to graduation to ensure that every one of our children graduates with a very clear post-secondary plan. These strategic bu budget decisions are again made by the school board through that annual budgeting process, which includes opportunities for community input. Ultimately, we believe the referendum is about continuing progress for our students. As many of you know, we have a vision for all of our students. We created that vision through discussions with our parents, with our students, with our community, with our staff. We want every child not only to master the academic skills they need to be successful, but we want them to master the interpersonal skills, to attain the creativity, the self-awareness, the cultural competence, the confidence they need to achieve their goals. And it's a vision that's not out of our reach. That's because we see it now. We see it coming to life through our graduates who already demonstrate the strengths, interests, skills, and bright futures that exist for every child. Ari Davis, a recent MMSD graduate, college student, aspiring educator, and future principal, was highlighted in our annual report recently and spoke to all of our school leaders to kick off the school year. He told us that Madison Schools gave him the knowledge and support to grow as a student and the foundation for a future career in education. In his own words, Ari told us, MMSD turned my dreams into goals that I can now view as a possible reality. Ari's story is one of great teaching, it's one of high expectations, it's one of opportunity, and it's the story we want for every child in Madison. I want to thank you for being here today to learn about our district's work and about the referendum, and at this point I'm going to go ahead and join our panel and we'll open it up for questions and answers. Yeah, I'll go sit with them. Oh, um, I was not planning on it. Do you want to, oh, why don't we introduce ourselves, how's that? Mike, do you want to introduce yourself and we'll go down the panel? Sure. Hi, my name is Mike Berry. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Business Services. And I'm Ed Hughes. I'm a member of the school board. Hi, Nancy Hanks, Chief of Schools for Elementary, supporting our 32 elementary schools in the district. Great. Let's start with the first question, which is what situation would you be in if the referendum does not pass? Um, thank you, Diana. I mentioned a little of this in our presentation already, but I think um, after uh, already going through two years of substantial cuts, um, making very difficult decisions um, in our school district, I think we've done all of the, the kinds of cuts that you can do around the classroom that are possible 
And um, without the referendum, we'll be going into a stage of cost cutting that I believe will begin to impact the classroom in ways we've been able to prevent in the past. And I'll let maybe Mike put a little more detail um, into that answer. Thanks, um, Jen. I think my, my comments would um, simply reinforce the themes you've already mentioned. I don't think it's a great mystery as to what would happen if the referendum uh, were, were not to pass. Uh, we're assuming that the, the state pattern of funding K-12, which is pretty well established now over the last six years, would likely continue. We don't anticipate a big change in state orientation towards K-12 funding. So that, based on that, we assume that we'll see less than 1% revenue growth, maybe three quarters of 1% revenue growth over the next few years. And we'll be making the same types of budget cutting, budget balancing um, actions that we have over the last couple of years. As Jen mentioned, 120 uh, FTE, $8 million worth of uh, uh, personnel and payroll costs were necessary, along with several other <laughs> budget balancing actions. And so, um, so when I say it shouldn't really be a surprise, what I, what I suspect is what you've seen from the district in the last couple of years, uh, you'll see again and again. And it's a pattern that we're concerned about. Before moving on to the next question, I'm wondering, because uh, I think the flip side of that is how it threatens the priority actions that we're investing in every year. Because every year we've, uh, I think have taken a really smart approach to budgeting by identifying a set of priority actions to make progress as a district while simultaneously having to make difficult decisions around cuts. And maybe Nancy could speak a little bit to the impact of not being able to invest in the priority actions that we've been able to invest in these last couple of years. Sure. I think one of the, the areas that you already spoke to was some of the progress that we've made um, around early literacy and students being on track for reading in third grade. I think that's an excellent example where we've invested time, but where we've also made um, critical investments as far as dollars and resources to support that work. Um, for example, in the past year, all of the teachers in our 12 highest needs elementary schools had access to additional professional development around literacy, as well as uh, additional software to support students um, in practicing around some of their foundational literacy skills. These are resources and supports that are above and beyond what we provide other schools in the district. And I think an example of where, when we make strategic investments, that we really see um, the progress and the results pay off. Um, and so in, in budget, I think, uh, difficulties where we're not able to make those investments, it really compromises our ability to see progress and to accelerate the path to closing gaps. Great. So here's the next question. According to what I've read, the average cost to a homeowner would be around $35 for each of the next four years. The questioner asks, what would happen after that? Mike, do you want to take that one? Sure. So the, um, the, the operating referendum um, it provides the school board with the authority to potentially increase the tax levy. And if the board exercised that authority to its fullest extent, then the increase, as we've estimated, it would be about $36 per year each year, laddering up over four years. Um, after that period, the um, board's revenue authority would have, um, would have peaked after four incremental increases and would stay there. Um, and, and that's as far as this solution goes. Um, we're trying to m make a, uh, a balance or take a balanced approach between trying to solve all funding problems forever or, or, um, or perhaps a little more balanced short-term approach. So this solution addresses the next four years. Great. I know there's been reference to this already, but this question asks, what exactly will the referendum pay for? And just to make it uh, more vivid and personal, we're sitting in the library at La Follette High School. What will be different here at La Follette if the referendum passes or if it doesn't? 
try that? I think if Alex Braylon was here, my my secondary counterpart, he would speak to, I think, the work that's being done around creating personalized pathways for students. Um, we've really been working hard to try to reimagine what the secondary experience is like for students um, and how they enter high school on track, but how they exit with a clear plan for what post-secondary is going to be for them. Um, there are some certainly investments that would need to be made in order to make sure that the momentum that we have around that work continues to move forward. Um, and so one thing that you may see in the very near future is students having the opportunity to opt into a pathway um, of their choosing um, that puts them on a path for post-secondary success. That's something that could potentially be compromised if we didn't have the ability to make strategic investments in our high schools and in the workaround pathways. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Can I speak to that? Um, if the referendum doesn't pass, and the projection is that we would be looking at, what, a $12 million budget gap next year, and then an additional $10 million on top of that in the following year. And so we would have to figure out, we being the board, in, in adopting a budget, where do we cut in order to, uh, in order to balance the budget? Um, you've heard that we would be likely laying off or, or reducing positions by 120 um, over the course of the two years. And the projection that supports that cut has other assumptions in it as well, which are that salaries are frozen there wouldn't even be any step increases. The traditional increases that have been built into the system for a number of years. We're also assuming no increase in health insurance costs, which would be a, a tough thing to make. But with that, with though within that context, then we on the board would be saying, well, are we going to lay off these 120 people, 75 one year, 45 another, or are we going to kind of find every other cut that we can make. So if you look around the library, we would be cutting subscriptions to the magazines. You know, we wouldn't be replacing the computers. Maybe the, the library would be cleaned less often than it otherwise would. We would be searching for everything that we could in order to maintain the quality of the education that our students uh, receive in the classrooms. So it would be, it would be a bloody difficult a uh, hard process uh, in order for us to look at avoiding, you know, finding every cut that we can make in order to avoid reducing, further reducing classroom staff and increasing class size. And so you would see, you know, you would see here and there what, what, the, what the adverse impact of that would be on our facilities and on, you know, extracurricular activities, on sports, on helmets for football players, you know, just <laughs> system-wide, there, there would be an impact. So let's stick with personalized pathways for just a minute because we've got two questions about them and I want to combine them. The first question is, why is referendum money needed for personalized pathways in addition to the grant money that the district received? And related to that, if the rent if referendum passes, how much of the funds would go toward personalized pathways? Oh, I'm sorry. We were having a little sidebar. <laughs> sorry, we, we were debating who was going to take this question. Um, I'll get it started and then Mike can chime in on some of the specifics. Um, can you repeat the first part of the question actually, Diana, for me? Yeah, the first part of the question has to do with the grant money that the district has yeah. received for personalized pathways and why additional money would be needed given that that grant money is in hand. Oh, got it. Actually, Mike, why don't you take that? Oh, we sure. Well, um, we were delighted that the Joyce Foundation um, came through with a, a planning uh, grant for to support um, personalized pathways. That... Um, grant is for a total of $400,000 and it supports the early planning um, design work around personalized pathways for both 2016-17 um, and the grant ends um, at the end of the 2017-18 year. So um, that grant uh, takes care of or helps us address the early planning but certainly not the full implementation of pathways over the next several years. Yeah, and I, I can take it from there. Sure. The, um, 
And I think this gets to the concept of priority actions actually quite well, because a priority action is something that we deem is important enough um, to accelerate student learning that we choose to repurpose funding internally in order to make it happen. Um, these priority actions, we always talk internally with our team, there is no new money, right? We're not funding, um, we don't fund our priority actions with new money. We have to repurpose everything in order to make them happen. So it's this annual process that would be happening, budget problems or not. Um, to redefine priorities and move funding into the places that are most important. So it's wonderful that Joyce has gotten us started, but we've known from the beginning that um, based on what we learned from that and our plan to expand um, that work uh, across our high schools would require making um, pathways of, of priority action in our budget. So without the, the funding um, that, that creates the stable environment for that process to work for us, um, we would be having a different kind of debate. Yeah. So let me stick with that for a minute. Um, the second question was about how much of the money from the referendum, if it passes, would go toward personalized pathways. I can give you figures for that we adopted for next year's budget. We haven't addressed it yet, and, and of course, for in future years' budgets. But um, for the 16-17 budget, um, we uh, budgeted about $60,000 for school-based uh, team planning for uh, academic and career plans. It was about $400,000, and this came from uh, f from the grants for personal, uh, for Pathways Professional Development. There was $289,000 in order to increase our staff by 3.4 positions at middle and high schools in order to support the uh, academic and career planning. So personalized pathways isn't just in high school, it also involves in middle schools getting students more focused on what their careers might be and having more uh, um, counselors in order to facilitate that work. Mm -hmm. There's also $25,000 for ninth grade transitional support, and we also invested $138,000 in order to make sure that our AVID program was aligned equitably among our middle schools, which also goes along to the, under the broader umbrella of the personalized pathways work in this year's budget. So that's, that's kind of where the dollars are going next year. Great. So a new topic, this has to do with um, hiring and retaining the best teachers. And the question is, what is the metric that the district will use to hire and retain the best teachers? What strategies will the district use? A couple of thro are thrown out as examples. Hiring bonuses, differential pay. Um, I'll, again, get us started. Anyone who wants to chime in, uh, feel free. Um, our school district has uh, spent uh, some significant time and energy over the last several years to define the competencies that we think are necessary in our district for our teachers to meet the needs of our students. Um, those are competencies that didn't exist previously. Um, we have aligned our recruitment and hiring practices to those competencies, as well as our evaluation practices to those competencies. In the last couple of years, we're actually in our third year of implementing an entirely new evaluation system. Mm -hmm. um, by the end of this year, every teacher in our district will have been evaluated using that system, um, as well as every principal. Um, so I think uh, that those, those are the metrics by which um, we measure whether or not s teachers are, are meeting that um, critical set of standards. What was the second part, Diana? Um, what strategies will Exciting the district bonuses. use? Oh, yeah. And there were two suggested. One was hiring bonuses and the other is differential pay. And just for the audience, can you explain what those mean? Um, I certainly can. Um, so there are a whole slew of strategies that are available to help incent educators um, in a whole variety of ways. Incent them to come to your district, to incent them to perform a particular job perhaps in a high needs area, to incent them to want to work in a school that has high needs. 
um, and uh, uh, things like differential pay may be a way of incenting a teacher to come to a particular district, a particular classroom, a particular school, a particular role. Um, we actually uh, made an important investment in time and energy over the last year to study um, our compensation system. And in large part, it was to this end. Um, how do we use compensation? And I, I mean that in the broadest sense, not just salary, but benefits um, and other forms of compensation uh, to make sure that we're attracting the best and the brightest, keeping the best and the brightest, and nurturing them throughout the the entirety of their career. Um, we received and presented those recommendations to the Board of Education just this past spring in June. Um, and we have been developing a plan to phase in those recommendations over time. And one that was uh, uh, particularly interesting to us um, was the idea of finding ways to incent a cohort of teachers, um, of high performing teachers, to potentially enter into a high need school together um, when there are enough openings in that school to allow uh, that cohort to enter. And, um, and we, we would love to try creative strategies like that to get um, some of our best teachers, even within the district, to move into new roles that they might not otherwise consider. Um, it's definitely something that we expect to see in our priority actions list in the near future. Does anybody want to add anything to that? No, I would, you earlier, I mean, you spoke to the idea that, I mean, one of our key recruitment strategies is leading with our mission and vision. Um, and the kind of quest that we're on to become a model public school district and to prove um, that you actually can accelerate progress for students and narrow gaps. I think there are a lot of educators that would tell you that although they certainly want to be respected and earn a living wage, that they do it for much more than the money, right? right. That they really want to make a tangible impact um, on students and change oftentimes their very life's trajectory. And so we try to talk about our work in ways that connect people to that mission and people get excited when they hear about the work that we're doing and the progress that we're making. Um, and they want to be a part of that. And we want people who understand that mission and vision and who deeply connect to that work. Yeah. Oh, I think Mike might want to Can I just add one last comment to that, which is sort of the, um, so the, the negative version of that question, which concerns <laughs> me greatly, um, which is that school districts don't shrink well. Um, and if we have very limited revenue, as you've already seen, we've talked about reduction of staff um, of 120 FTE in the recent past two years. And as Jen said, we've tried very hard to keep those reductions away from the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Um, but our ability to do that over time, it, it, well, it just becomes more and more difficult. And then we begin to um, get into a cycle where we're, we're actually at, we have policies and practices that are at, at odds with each other. We are trying and succeeding and recruiting um, uh, newly hired staff, um, a more diversified staff, mm -hmm. that we train and, and go through professional development only to then have to reduce staff. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, it is the recently hired that we have to uh, part company with. And that becomes this really self-defeating um, process. And um, uh, we would do well to avoid that. So I know in, in a lot of districts across the state, in order to deal with the challenges of attracting some teachers into some high needs areas, they're paying hiring bonuses. In some cases, quite a lot. I heard a story about one teacher who was offered $25,000 to move from one district to another. <coughs> Is uh, the Madison School District doing that? And if not, why not? And if so, why? Um, that's a great question. The, the it is there is it is fiercely competitive um, in the state of Wisconsin right now, especially for teachers in high needs areas. And you're right that um, we've been uh, all doing our best to steal each other's people, <laughs> um, which is somewhat infuriating, to be perfectly honest. Um, it doesn't make for a great environment for teachers, I don't think, um, in our state. 
I, um, we have the ability to offer hiring bonuses, um, and we've done some use of that um, strategically, but uh, I don't think that we have maximized that strategy. Um, and I actually think it is something that um, certainly can help, um, especially for teachers in those high needs areas. Um, we're looking for more s teachers who can work with students with disabilities. We're looking for more teachers who are bilingual. Um, we have some, some serious shortage areas. Um, and I think that is a recommendation from the compensation study uh, that we were asked to explore more depth. Could I add to that? Yeah. Um, the school districts that are paying $20,000 or $25,000 to keep their key, key teachers aren't doing that because they want to. Right. You know, they're doing that because they're facing a threat that their teachers who are, you know, their stars in their schools are leaving, often leaving right before school starts, and they mm -hmm. need to have someone in front of the class when the doors open the next week. And so yeah. they do what they have to do. And that creates all kinds of problems in the school when you have someone coming in and getting paid more than the teachers who have been there and doing a great job for 15 or 20 years. So the kind of one-off signing bonus, $20,000 type of situation is something that fortunately we haven't had to, uh, we haven't had to go down that road because we haven't had those sorts of crises. And I hope that we don't. I think what Jen is talking about is a more sy systematic approach in terms of, you know, finding those key positions that are that are inherently difficult to fill over time and seeing if we can make some adjustments there yeah. but we're not going to get into the headhunting business the way that you know the school districts that have had no choice have had to go i think agreed mm -hmm. so here's another question about teachers the question is what are you hearing from teachers about how things are working or not working in their schools what are their biggest concerns and let me add to that um, if the referendum passes, how will funds be used to address those concerns? Yeah. So again, I'll start and then everyone can chime in. Um, I think the thing that I hear most from teachers is about the uh, um, a kind of general environment in the state of Wisconsin that doesn't support them. And um, that plays out in all kinds of ways. I think that um, our teachers crave stability. And I think stability is very different from the status quo, right? I, I don't think that teachers want status quo, but in order to make improvement, in order to make progress, in order to do the hard work that we continue to ask them to do in a job that's changed a lot, um, and just is inherently more demanding, uh, is the job, um, they actually need stability to do their best work. That means knowing what they can expect in a paycheck or with their, with their health care benefits. Um, it includes knowing that they're going to have a job. Mm -hmm. And even though last year we didn't have to lay off any teachers at the end of the day, thankfully, um, we definitely had teachers who received those notices, which is um, very uh, troubling, right? I mean, it puts you off balance in your life when you receive a layoff notice, um, even if it gets recalled at the last minute. Um, but despite the fact that we had to do that um, with fewer positions, we had a lot of reshuffling that happened, right? Teachers being moved from class, from grade to grade, from school to school to fill the remaining open spots. And even that, right, annual process um, is destabilizing. Um, we want people to have the stability they need to do the work that, they were, that we're asking them to do. Does anybody want to add anything to that? Um, sure, I was in two schools today. Um, <laughs> and I think our teachers, one, our, our certainly working extremely hard um, and many of them balancing both um, the academic demands and the needs that their students have um, with also maybe needs that are outside of the school that find themselves into the classroom into the school day. Um, I think our work around that we're exploring around community schools is one way that we're thinking about how do we better support 
some of our schools that maybe have more of those needs or challenges present in a more comprehensive way. Um, I think I think there's a lot of promise in those two models, Mendota and Leopold, our current schools that are actually working to integrate that community schools model. But I hear that a lot from our educators. It's the constant balancing act of wanting to hold students to high expectations, uh, making sure that they can reach their potential and that they support them, but they also are keenly aware of the challenges that students um, bring into the school and they want to be able to connect them to those supports and resources. Great, so I have two questions that I'm going to combine. The first one is, how did you come up with this dollar amount for the referendum? And related to that, this question is, didn't we just pass a $41 million referendum in 2015? How does this relate to that? Do you want to take the first one, Mike? How did we come up with the $26 million? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, um, the, the, the parameters for this answer are that um, we were trying to balance two um, important uh, values. One was to um, provide enough revenue into the, in the school district uh, for the next four years to provide at least a reasonable chance uh, with, minim with minimizing distractions and let the schools do their work. Um, that's an important value. Um, and, but we had to counterbalance that with affordability. And um, so we tried to model the two out and um, um, essentially just kept running models until we felt like we had a solution that um, struck a good balance between those, those two ideas. Um, this referendum will provide the revenue authority um, that the board is seeking um, to um, certainly support operations for the next four years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the next four years are going to be just be, um, you know, really um, uh, financially without challenge. There's going to be a challenge, there always is, um, but at least we have a reasonable chance of minimizing distractions and doing the work we're supposed to do. So that's part A, and part B was on the was on the financial side. We were we were trying to model the tax levy and make sure that it stayed reasonable. Um, and um, at the dollar amount we struck, which was about thirty six dollars per year each year for the next four years, we felt that um, that that was in line with Madison's historical um, tax levy increases. We also felt good about the fact that um, that Madison, as a community, as a as an economy, is is growing uh, and thriving so much that that there would be strong tax base growth uh, that would make this affordable. And it was that combination of factors. Can I add a little historical context to that? And at the risk of of confusing and boring everyone about revenue limits. Revenue <laughs> limits are established by the state on a per student basis. And before 2010, uh, from the time revenue limits started in 1993, the legislature increased them year to year somewhere between $200 and $275 per student per year. That was kind of the general um, range, the traditional increase over time under revenue limits. An increase of $5 million a year is a little bit less than $200 a student. And $8 million a year is in the neighborhood of $275 per student, because we have 27,000 students for these purposes. And so um, the increasing the revenue limits, $5 million, $5 million, $8 million, and $8 million, what that does is that just kind of brings us back to the way things used to be traditionally from the time revenue limits started in 1993 up till 2010. We're not, you know, it's not out of line in terms of an increase. It really is just kind of a, a, a standard increase in, in back in those days. People were complaining about how it wasn't enough. It will still require us to make cuts, but it's, it's well in line with what the historical traditions have been. 
And then with respect to the last, main, uh, the last referendum, that was a facilities referendum. That's going to build elevators in our schools that need them, to redo the, the theater at Madison <laughs> East, to uh, put in walls at Jefferson Middle School that doesn't have them. So it's a number of uh, discrete facilities uh, investments that we need to make but not an operational revenue. It doesn't, it doesn't help us with what our ongoing uh, operational needs are year to year. I would just add that when we considered the tax impact, we looked at all of that in combination to make sure that everything we were asking from our taxpayers was affordable for them. So related, uh, here's a question about what's going on across the state. And I think this is a good follow-up to what you were just saying, Ed. Could you talk about the support for referenda around the state and why, why there has been such an increase in support for referenda? Mm. Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first um, uh, attempt at that. So um, it, school districts have historically, in Wisconsin, been... Uh, funded through a funding partnership, state and local. And you're only seeing half of that partnership here tonight. And I think what Ed was getting at was that the state has had sort of a sea change in its approach to funding K-12. It's not 200 or 250 or $275 per student, roughly letting school district budgets grow at the rate of inflation. That's gone. We're down to minimal funding for K-12. That does a couple of things. It helps the state balance what its, its, um, its budget in terms of how much money it has to allocate for K-12, and it fulfills a certain political agenda around taxation. But um, that leaves the other end of the par funding partnership, the local um, side, the school district side, uh, having to turn to, to um, operating referenda. And so um, there has been a significant increase in operating referenda where s local school districts are asking their community to exceed the state revenue limit. It's essentially a choice. Which model do you support? The state's approach to funding K-12 or your local choice? And that same question is being asked here in, in Madison. There was, uh, there have been a series of articles in the uh, Journal Sentinel this week about the impact of Act 10 on school districts across the state, and the f and the focus has been on what we discussed earlier about teachers, um, recruiting teachers and losing them and paying bonuses, and how various school districts are dealing with that, in particular rural school districts, which are really, in a world of hurt about this. And there was an interview with the governor. And he was asked about, well, what are these school districts going to do? And he said, well, you know, if the school communities want to spend more, then they've got to go to referendum and pass the referendum. And we say, okay, that's what we got to do. That's what we're going to do. Uh, he said, otherwise, you have to get creative. And, you know, <laughs> getting creative is a little difficult when you're looking at the, those kinds of budget deficits. So we really are in a, in a situation where it isn't an unusual situation that prompts a referendum. Referenda are becoming standard operating yeah. procedure across the state for the school districts that, that can count on the support of the community like we are fortunate to be able to do here in Madison. <coughs> Great, so here's another question about money. Uh, this person asks, I would like to know how much money the Madison schools receives each year per student compared to what tuition pays for at private schools. I can, well, I'll give, I'll, I, I'm not sure I can address the private schools yeah. because I, I suppose that depends on which, which private school you, you have in mind. Um, but as to, um, let's just call it cost per pupil, um, uh, for this past year, um, our school district uh, was at $13,519 per pupil. And that number uh, was about 10% higher than the state average. And it has historically been 10% above the state average. We looked at this eight years for, we went back eight years and 18 years. And it, the pattern hasn't really changed much. Madison has typically been about 10% over the state average. And there are reasons for that. Uh, Jen mentioned the number of uh, students who um, are English language learners. 
Uh, and by the way, we don't consider that a burden. We consider that a core part of our mission. But it does increase the cost per student. And there are other needs that are present in, in, in our community, in any urban community, that tend to account for why an urban district would be about 10% over the state average, as opposed to small rural districts and what have you. So Madison's spending pattern hasn't really changed historically. Um, we're just facing the same issue that every other school district is facing, just minimal revenue growth. So here's a question about early reading skills, and it relates to what you were starting us with, Nancy. The question is specifically, we know that early reading skills are very important for long-term student success. What are you doing to move these scores? Sure. I think it, it started actually uh, quite a few years ago. One was uh, placing consistent instructional materials um, in each of our 32 elementary schools, which is something that we didn't have before, which included uh, materials that focused on early reading skills, explicit phonics instruction for students. Um, our students, in addition to learning early reading skills, also have time during the school day where they get access to grade level standards <laughs> and materials, where they're really working to not only become stronger readers, but to understand and apply what they um, actually read as well. Um, but in addition to that, again, like I mentioned earlier, um, we've been able to target areas where we haven't traditionally seen um, our early reading scores be as strong in those 12 to 13 highest needs elementary schools. We provided additional professional development for all of the teachers in kindergarten, first and second grade around early literacy skills on a quarterly basis this past year. And this year we extended that professional development to teachers in grades K through five in those 13 um, schools. So again, it's about making sure that all of our teachers have access to consistent high quality tools and materials across each of our schools, but making sure that we target get support, training, um, and materials in areas where we need to see accelerated growth and progress for those students. Great. So I've got two questions about administrators. And the first one is, can we cut administrators instead of teachers? And the second is, how many of the administrators go to the schools on a regular basis to see the schools and staff in action unannounced? I'll start and maybe Nancy will want to chime in on this. Um, we have. I mean, that's the thing. The 120 uh, positions that we've uh, eliminated over the last couple of years haven't only been teaching positions. In fact, we tried to stay away from teaching positions um, and focused heavily on central office um, for the last two years. Um, we've, I can't, do you remember the total that's amount sure. of... Well, I was actually looking for dollar amount. Do you know it off the top of your head? I can't remember it right now. A, su a substantial amount <laughs> was cut from central office. Um, I used to have that number at my fingertips, but I haven't said that um, in a little while. Um, but we started there and, um, and examined those positions, it's those positions, examined other support positions at the school level before going to classroom positions. And we'll continue to do so. Um, I think um, I think our big challenge is that we've we've uh, cut so many positions from central office and are so lean at this point that if we continue to cut even more, um, we would have to outright cancel services. Um, certain mm -hmm. functions would not be able to be performed anymore, um, and I don't say that to be overly dramatic. That's just mm -hmm. the reality. Um, and then as to the second part, um, as we have made our central office team leaner and meaner over, I say that in a positive way, over the last several years, um, we have redesigned the function of central mm -hmm. office. Um, we think that a school system, um, uh, an urban school system in particular, um, of our size cannot be successful without a a, a strong central office that really understands what it means to serve schools well. Um, so while every school in our district has a very clear plan of action to improve student achievement and narrow um, and close achievement gaps, we have 
redesign the way central office works in schools in support of those plans. Mm -hmm. um, we exist to help schools put those plans into action um, and to remove any barriers that stand in their way. Um, we often say that the central office exists <laughs> to either maximize um, the implementation of a school's improvement plan or to minimize distraction. And, um, and that has been equally important um, as we think about becoming uh, both more efficient and more effective as a school district. Would you add anything to that, Nance? No, I think uh, the second piece was around visitation to mm -hmm. schools. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a, a quite a bit of visitation of schools that goes <laughs> along with um, my role, um, and not for the purpose of, of schools putting on a show, but to really get into classrooms, to talk about how their strategies are playing out um, in real time, what's working, what's not working. Um, for instance, I was in two schools today for no less than about three hours, Marquette this morning and Orchard Ridge in the afternoon. Um, both great school visits where we looked at their current data. Um, we spent over an hour in classrooms observing instruction in real time, um, talked about their professional development plan and what the next steps would be um, in the next time bef before I would see them again, which is in about a month. Um, and I'll do no less than about 150 of those visits across the 32 schools um, this year. So we, we do put a premium on maintaining close proximity to the work, not just to monitor it, um, but it really is a two-way kind of feedback loop for us. And it gives us an opportunity to make sure that um, we're learning about the execution of our plans in real time. We really feel like you can't make great decisions as a central office on behalf of schools um, without maintaining that close proximity to the work of schools and teachers. And in this year's budget, we um, saved $2.8 million as a result of central office reduction in efficiencies. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. 2.81. Great. So that again, I want to encourage the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down and we'll make sure they get answered. Here's um, another. So if the referendum does pass, what are your plans to follow up with the community so they understand how the money is or was being spent? Um, I'll get that one started. We, um, one of the big changes that we're making to this year's budget process is we're starting a lot earlier, um, which will include uh, more uh, public input at an earlier stage. Um, typically, we begin the public budgeting process in about January, um, and that leads into an April um, preliminary budget draft and then um, approval of that in June um, and then final approval in October. Um, this year we're actually starting now. We'll be actually kicking off next year's bu budget process on Monday yeah. with the Board of Education um, seeking early input on our goals um, and guiding principles for the year as well as those essential priority actions to keep our district's momentum um, and our progress moving in the right direction. Um, and we think that that adjustment in the budget process will help us be more accountable to our community when it comes to how we, we spend every dollar. Ed, I don't know if you would like to well, add Well, I would just that. add, and, and the results of that spending are summed up in an annual report that comes out every summer about how the That's progress right. we've yeah. made on the strategic framework and we've identified the metrics that we're going to be looking at like third grade reading scores like you know these uh, scores in fifth and eighth grade and report to the community each summer about how we're doing and you know where those hours were spent and what the payoff has been. That's right. Mm -hmm. We don't have any more questions so I'd like to turn to the panelists and give each one of you a minute or so just to Make some closing comments. What do you want us to take away from this evening? Mm. I think um, ultimately the having the opportunity to continue 
the momentum that we've built in our district is very um, important to us. Um, again, our resolve is not weakened. Um, we know that our teachers and our schools have currently been doing some amazing work on behalf of the 27,000 students um, that we serve, and we want to continue that work. And where we have learned where things are working extremely well, we want to accelerate progress in some areas. And so I see this as an opportunity for us to continue the trajectory that we've been on, but to also um, move even faster. Um, speaking for the school board, we take it seriously when we're asking the community in a referendum to <laughs> authorize us to spend more money, to spend your dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that we enter into lightly. And what we're asking for is spending authority. It may be that we won't need it all, and if not, we won't spend it all. So this isn't, you know, a blank check saying, here, we're definitely going to spend this money and this is what we're going to spend it on. What it is, the, the referendum from our perspective, is designed to enable us to do the kind of budgeting that we think we need in order to provide the quality of the education that our community wants and is willing to pay for, but not more than, than we need. We will continue to look at expenditures with a close eye and really try and minimize what the impact is because we're certainly aware of you know how distressing it can be when that property tax bill comes at the end of the year particularly for those in our community who are on fixed incomes and for, for, for whom property taxes really take a big bite so we're aware of that every day and we are conscious of what we're asking for from the community and we will do our best to um, exercise the spending authority you give us with with as much responsibility as we can muster yeah, boy, that's really well said. I'm not sure I have uh, much to add to that, um, other than to say that, that to kind of just restate the whole premise here, which is that we're, we feel it's our job to look ahead, uh, to anticipate what's going to happen at the state level and how it's going to affect their community. We think we've made reasonable projections about where the state is at and towards, in terms of funding K-12. And um, we're trying to act now to, um, you know, to, to essentially um, ask for a more balanced approach to um, uh, operating the school district. We understand that we have cost control and cost cutting obligations and we're happy to do our part. Uh, we're also asking for reasonable revenue growth at the same time. And, um, and we're asking for this uh, operational levy really to stabilize the, um, the organization on the one hand and then also, as Nancy said, to you know, maintain the positive momentum that's been built here over the last few years and it's that combination that um, we hope the community will support. I think my final comment um, echoing uh, which I think will echo what everyone else has said is um, I think first and foremost we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think that we had to. Um, Right, I'd, I'd much rather be home with my four-year-old son right now, I love you guys, um, than here uh, talking about a referendum on the ballot. And um, I think that uh, when we brought this concept to the board for consideration, I had three goals in my mind. One, I needed to prove to our board yet again um, that our team has... Um, uh, what it takes to get better results for children. Um, and I think we've built up, fortunately, that kind of credibility with our own school board and our own community over the last several years. Um, right, we're, we, we've demonstrated that we're onto something and that if given uh, the sp space and room to do so, that we can do even more. Um, the second is I had to um, demonstrate that we have taken a responsible approach to budgeting over the last few years. And I think that we have proven that we have. Um, we've made dif difficult uh, choices and made critical investments simultaneously, with no, which is no small task. We've established a way of working, a way of budgeting that I think is powerful and getting better every year. Um, and we had to prove our, our proposal's affordability to the taxpayer. That was incredibly important to our board. We knew that going in, incredibly important to us. Um, 
and I think we were able to prove that to our school board. Um, and now it's in, uh, as you know, the community's hands to make their decision. Great. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and I'd like to thank those of you who are watching live stream on Facebook. It's not our role to tell you how to vote, but I think it is our role to encourage you to vote. Um, again, the question about the referendum is on the back of the ballot. We have some people in the audience who look to me not to be old enough to vote. Um, I thank you in particular for coming and encourage you to encourage those of us who are old enough to vote to vote. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>